Good morning, and welcome to the Columbus Women's Commission's second annual Signature to Action event. So Nationwide's inclusive culture is anchored in our 90 plus year history of valuing people. We fully understand that if we're going to compete today and into the future, that we must value all people. When Shannon shared with us that she and the mayor was introducing this particular initiative, we wanted to be a part of it. The reality is, is that we are a growing, thriving community and we are bringing new businesses into this community every day. If in fact you are not known as a workplace that supports women and supports all people, you're not going to be able to compete. I think it's a business imperative to support women. I think it's a business imperative to support all of your associates. We have very large corporations like Nationwide Insurance and Ohio Health and small nonprofits like Action for Children and everything in between. That's really important for us. If you don't have policies that support women and families, such as paid time off, caregiver leave, then pay equity is really just a part of gender equity. We're all connected through our families, through our interactions, no matter what the differences or the categories or demographics are, we're all connected in the same way because community is family, family is community. They're one and the same. While I was at Action for Children, I had a, a pregnancy that was pretty rough. I was a high-risk pregnancy to begin with. I also had some, some personal things happen at home where I was a single mother. I had my, my child at 28 and a half weeks. There was a lot of anxiety with that. If it weren't for Action for Children signing this commitment, I wouldn't have been able to be available for the bedside visits with the doctors. When my daughter was born, she was two pounds, seven ounces. You know, just being able to hold your child and not worry about, will I have a job tomorrow? One of the best ways that we as a community can support each other is just to have the same underlying respect and honor for everyone's diverse and unique situation. I think the work of the Women's Commission says to the city of Columbus and to the nation that this work is important. The goal is that we don't need to exist anymore because Columbus is a place where pay equity, gender equity have been largely resolved so that women and families can thrive here. Please join me in welcoming to the stage First Lady and Chair of the Columbus Women's Commission, Shannon Ginther. Good morning and welcome to our second annual Columbus Commitment from Signature to Action Best Practices event. A huge thank you to all of you for joining us for leading the way in our community on the issues of pay equity, gender equity, and for embracing the work of the Columbus Women's Commission. I wanna give a special shout out to our mayor. I get to call him Andy. Thank you, Andy, for making changing the story of women and families in our community a top priority of your administration. This work began with your commitment to dismantle barriers provide accessible pathways to economic prosperity, and make Columbus a more open city for everyone. I also want to thank and acknowledge the elected officials here with us today, including Representative Stephanie House, Judge Terry Jamison, Council President Pro Tem Elizabeth Brown, Council Member Emmanuel Remy, and to all of the elected officials who could not join us but supported the work since its inception your commitment to gender and racial equity is important, and we thank you for being with us so we can co-create a gender equitable Columbus. And thanks to all of you and your pledge to the Columbus commitment. We exceeded our goal last year to secure 175 adopters, and today have 202 employers who have signed, impacting thousands of Central Ohio employees. Today is about continuing to learn together around the gender pay gap, understanding how race and other factors create even larger disparities in our community, 
and sharing with one another the actions we're taking. I want to, of course, thank our generous corporate sponsors who have made today possible. Those include AEP, Baker Hostetler, Cardinal Health, the Columbus Partnership, EM h and Fifth Third Bank, Huntington, L Brands, Nationwide, Ohio Health, Ohio State University Athletics, and lastly, Columbus Women's Commissioner Jeff Little. Thank you. Our work here today truly matters to women, to families, and to you, our employers. When we established the Columbus Women's Commission, we knew we didn't have all the answers and immediately teamed up to learn from our partners, working towards full equity for women. Early on, Commissioner and Columbus City Council President Pro Tem Elizabeth Brown led the work to advance paid family leave policies in the city. And I'm proud to say that the city of Columbus was an early adopter of paid family leave and now other employers in the community have followed. The Women's Fund of Central Ohio has been our partner from day one, and their latest research on the gender and racial wealth gap is the next step in addressing economic security for women in Central Ohio. Earlier research found that the pay gap nationally for women on average is 80 cents to every dollar a man earns. Their newer research on the wealth gap is actually much more dramatic. Single women on average only own 40 cents to every dollar a single man owns, and this is even more telling for women of color. Latina women own eight cents to every dollar, and black women only two cents for every dollar owned by a single man. This newly collected data will help to drive our work and evidence-based solutions to assuring economic prosperity for all. And the YWCA. The YWCA's leadership for social change in our community has made them our partner, for the, a great partner for the Women's Commission. They're fiercely committed to housing and childcare, two key barriers facing women in our community. I come from a long line of strong women and I learned from them early on the importance of using your voice to stand up for yourself and for others. The very embodiment of the YWCA's mission to empower women and eliminate racism. Here's what we know. We make a difference when the changes we seek are measured by their impact they have on women and their everyday lives in this community. And we know that one in four women in Franklin County are economically insecure. On average, they make 78 cents for every dollar a man makes. This gap is real, and when you consider the pay loss over time, the economic impact for women and families is staggering. 38% of women in the workforce in Central Ohio earn less than $15 an hour. And more than 52,000 women in our community are single heads of their household. So pay equity was a starting point for the Women's Commission, but we quickly realized that to achieve true gender equity, we must create a culture that supports women and all employees by addressing workplace policies such as paid family leave, salary, prior salary history, and hiring practices. And we know there's a strong business case for this work. And as the workplace evolves in the 21st century, so does our work as a community. Before launching into our conversation around pay equity today, I wanted to briefly touch on some of the other initiatives of the Columbus Women's Commission, all deeply linked to economic prosperity for women in our community. Housing, recognizing the alarming rate of evictions in our community. We looked at the data and listened to women's experiences within that system. While not all evictions lead to, lead to homelessness, most homeless women and families have experienced eviction. In 2017, there were over 17,000 evictions filed in Franklin County Municipal Court, and over 6,500 families were set out of their homes. The commission found this unacceptable and convened the court system leadership to exchange information and perspectives about the eviction process and explore ways to reduce the impact of evictions in our community. Because of our partner's commitment to the work, the Franklin County Municipal Court Self-Help Resource Center, which helps families in real time avoid evictions, 
was moved to a new location where services are more readily accessible to our community's residents. And in the fourth quarter of 2018 alone, they served more families than in 2016 and 2017 combined. So what's next for this work? We will continue to work with our court leadership partners to impact policies and practices facing our residents in courtroom 11A, which is the evictions courtroom, and to further integrate and enhance supportive services for our families. In the area of workforce development, for those 52,000 female-headed households I mentioned earlier, in this community, the poverty rate for them is six times higher. The economic security of Columbus families is dependent on women more than ever before. Almost two-thirds of mothers with children under the age of six are working outside of the home, and local data tells us that child care costs represent over 30% of the basic budget expenses for a woman with two children. The Women's Commission is focused on impacting policy to help more women gain access to affordable child care and to educate the community on the important connection between child care and the workforce. And this year, we're also focused on understanding and amplifying career pipelines for women, especially in the skilled trades. These positions have 100% pay equity, along with paid leave and benefits. And there's a growing need for these jobs in Central Ohio. We are working hard to raise awareness of skilled trades as an opportunity for women and families in this community and to begin to build a solid connection for women to access these opportunities. And in health, last year the infant mortality rate in Franklin County for all residents was 7.5 infant deaths per thousand live births. For non-Hispanic black residents, the rate is 12.3 deaths per thousand live births. Teen pregnancy has been shown to contribute to an increase in premature birth, infant mortality, poverty, and Medicaid costs. The Women's Commission understands that educating our teenagers on the resources they have to prevent pregnancy and sexually transmitted infection is important. Ohio is the only state in the country with no health education standards in schools, which makes it difficult to ensure all children receive appropriate, medically accurate, and evidence-based health education to make empowering life choices. Over the next year, the Women's Commission will work alongside partners to change this to provide education and empower our teens to make informed life choices. So as you can see, we are here to stay fiercely committed to our work and to changing women's stories. So now, let's talk gender equity. Let's talk about innovation in this community. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to our special guests and panelists. My friend and partner in this work, Gail King, Executive Vice President and Chief Administrative Officer for Nationwide. For serving as a commissioner, for being all in in this work, and for guiding the pay equity pledge in our community. Mike Kaufman, CEO of Cardinal Hall. Thank you, Mike, for being one of our community's biggest champions of this work and for your willingness early on to speak up and push for progress on these issues. Denise Robinson, President and CEO of Alvis House. One of our newest commissioners, thank you for your leadership in the nonprofit sector, for tirelessly advocating for those in crisis for your continued leadership in workforce development, opportunities for women, and for leading by your example each and every day. Francie Henry, Regional Vice President, Fifth Third Bank. Thank you for your charisma, transparency, and authentic leadership in our community. And lastly, not least, Mayor Ginther. So let's get started. All right. All right. Well, good morning. Good morning, Columbus, Ohio. All right. Thank you. 
Hey, I am so excited to have the opportunity to interview this esteemed panel as we provide you with some of the best practices that have, have worked at our different organizations. But before we jump into the panel, I think it would be very appropriate for us to recognize and acknowledge Shannon Ginther and Mayor Ginther for their partnership in championing this important work. So Shannon, would you bring your little stuff back out here and let's give you a big round of applause. Come on, Mayor Ginther, stand up. Let's thank you. What is this? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think what we know in this city is that nothing happens until someone decides that it will happen. And in Columbus, Ohio, we have fabulous leaders and certainly the Genthers have proven their leadership. So as I said, we have an outstanding panel for you and we're gonna jump right into it. So your programs gave you a little bit of information about our panelists this morning and what I'd like to do so that we can get familiar with one another is perhaps kick it off with a question to each of them to, for them to share something about themselves that perhaps their bio wouldn't tell you. So I'm gonna start with Mike. Mike Kaufman, you wanna introduce yourself and tell us something we wouldn't know that you like to do? Okay, I'm Mike Kaufman. I am the CEO of Cardinal Health. Uh, one of my favorite things to do um, is to actually shop for my wife. I hate to shop for myself. I go like once a year and get everything I need, but I love to shop for my wife. Um, but to keep my man card, I like to bass fish too a lot. So, um, <laughs> um, so those are my two activities. And I'm just so excited to be here and be engaged because this is such a personal topic to me. I've been involved in gender equity now for probably 12 year, years or so. And a lot of it has to do with uh, having a daughter and a wife who's worked. And a lot of uh, women have given me great breaks in my careers over the years. And that just feels like not only the right thing to do, but the smart thing to do. All right, I would agree. And I believe his wife is somewhere here. Linda, where are you so we can see you? Stand up so we can give you a round of applause. <laughs> we appreciate you. Thanks for coming. All right, Denise. Wow, you took me off guard. <laughs> Something that's not in my bio, I think um, that's not in my bio is I love to travel. Um, it's one of the things that I can always look at different cultures um, and see how um, culturally organ um, different countries um, you know, conduct themselves. And so for me, it's not just a vacation, it's also a learning experience for me to be able to, um, to, to witness that personally. Sounds great, thank you. All right, Mayor, we know a lot about you. Yeah. Okay, so what do we Good, not know? <laughs> um, my very first job was at Sisters Chicken and Biscuits. Oh at Morse and High, it used to be the old Jerry's Drive-In, now it's a TJ's. TJ's. And at the age of 14 in our house, you had to uh, get a job or volunteer and work at least uh, 10 hours a week, that was part of the deal. So I went down and got my little work permit and uh, worked 10 hours a week at Sister's Chicken and Biscuits. And uh, right. it taught me a lot, uh, <laughs> it taught me a lot. Uh, and, uh, but it was a great experience and I'm grateful for that and so many other things my parents did to show me the right way. Great, thank you. And last but not least, Francie, what do you have to share with us? So happy to be here with everyone here today. I, uh, I guess when I think about what makes uh, me who I am today, a lot of us can refer back to how we grew up. Uh, my parents immigrated here from Greece, and uh, we grew up in Mount Vernon, Ohio, and here's something different. My dad owned a restaurant, and he was shocked <laughs> that Greeks owned a restaurant. <laughs> so I never got paid for my work in the restaurant, unlike the mayor. Uh, but I think it gave us a unique perspective in Knox County at the time, uh, less than 1% of the population spoke something other than the English language. Mm -hmm. But we were taught, raised, and believed that our differences uh, were something to be celebrated. Uh, most cultures believe in that as well. And I don't know how we've gotten to the point where their differences aren't celebrated as such and drive us into more of our corners. But you know, what I hope to continue to do is learn from you know, their great history learn from what we have experienced as a family, and I think it gives me another perspective from a cultural perspective and a gender perspective to learn and grow. 
All right. Well, first of all, thank you all for sharing something personal about yourselves. Uh, so what we'd like to do now is really jump into the conversation. Uh, so we're here because of the Columbus Women's Commission and the fact that we believe that our community is better than what the statistics say. And we believe that together we can change it. And so I'm interested, and I'm going to start with you, Mayor, on this, and then just, I'd like to hear from each of you on this, is as you think about the work of the Columbus Women's Commission and our community to move the, gen, uh, to move the needle as it relates to gender equality and inclusion, what does this work mean to you? And tell us a little bit about why you decided to make this part of your platform. Well, you know, this issue and, and this work continues uh, to evolve for me. And I, as I spend more time in it and learning from the commission and from Shannon and other great leaders that are here and employers that have been in this space for a long time, like Cardinal, Accenture, others, um, what I am discovering is the direct connection between pay equity, gender equity, and family stability and resiliency. Uh, and so I continue to learn, and, and just learned the other day, talking with Council Member Liz Brown, she shared a couple of stats with me that really drives home why this matters and a sense of urgency for this community. So 57% of our neighbors here in this community are financially insecure, meaning they have less than $2,000 in savings. So their one illness, their one car repair, their one uh, major event from uh, literally uh, a house of cards scenario where they may end up homeless and out of work and displaced and children uh, in, a, in a transitional transient environment. 42% of our neighbors <clears throat> have a subprime credit score. So pay equity and gender equity, particularly since so many households in this community are led and headed and contributed to by women, is directly connected to family stability and resilience. And we know that's where neighborhood uh, quality of life, uh, uh, the strength of our neighborhoods, uh, that drive what great cities. Great cities are made up of distinct uh, uh, neighborhoods. And so this is really at the core of our agenda. I talk about it all the time, that this is not an initiative or a project. This is the heart and soul of my agenda as mayor and uh, the Women's Commission um, and all of the great leaders that are working in this space, uh, I think have done an incredible job bringing this to light and equipping partners uh, with best practices to help drive change. Sounds great. Thank you, Mayor. And so, Denise, if you would tell us a little bit about what does this work mean to you and why did you and your company sign up for the uh, Columbus commitment? So first of all, um, Alvis, we're very proud to be able to make this commitment. Um, it's something that's really near and dear to my heart. And I think it took me all of five minutes after reading um, the pledge that I could sign on um, as, a, as a company because we've done a lot in this space um, for years, for many years. Um, for me, um, I'm just really proud to be able to do this, kind of like Francie. I grew up in a small town. My father was a police officer and my mom was a teacher. And um, in that space, we were always taught to respect everyone, no matter how they were, who they were, what color they were. Um, and we always, they always taught me to always make sure that everyone's equal. I never had um, a situation where um, I found that there was no equity. I never saw that until I came, moved to Columbus to go to Ohio State. <laughs> um, so I never saw those kinds of things. So when, when I was asked to participate in this, it, it really made sense to me because, um, because our organization really has a commitment to that, number one. Number two is the client population that I serve the women, um, we talk about the pay, and First Lady mentioned the 78% 78 on the dollar. Well, just think about the women that I serve in my programs have been, who have been involved in the criminal justice system. They're not gonna make that 80 cents. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna do that, and I feel it's my job to make sure that that happens, um, that they have the, the same access that everyone else does. And, and one more thing is that um, I think it's really important when you talk about 
um, making sure that our clients are, and our clients and our staff, um, my, my staff is probably 60% 60, 60 women. But um, so I need to make sure just, not just with the clients, but also with our staff. Mm -hmm. so, um, it's, it's, I'm really happy to be here and really happy that we were able to sign that commitment immediately. Great. Sounds great, thank you. Okay, Mike, would you share with us what does this work mean to you? Uh, it means several things. I think, first of all, it was really easy to sign up for the pledge. I've been um, personally looking at pay equity across folks that report to me and another level down and requiring our folks to do that for um, years. And so that was easy because I know that's important for us. And it really began when I um, asked to run our women's initiative about 10 years ago, which was really kind of odd because it never had a man running our women's initiative before. But our, the female had left the company, and so I began to run the initiative. And I did it because I thought I was, you know, really understanding of the issues, but I, I knew that if I ran it, I'd learn more. And it was amazing how many things I didn't realize, which is why I, I know we'll talk about it later, but engaging men is so important. And it really helped me understand real issues and see real examples and, and open my eyes to stuff. And so it's really important to me to keep this conversation going because I personally know how I'm a much different leader, husband, and father since I got engaged um, than I was before I got engaged. Sounds great, thank you. And Francie, so we'll close out with you on this question. Yeah, I think you know, as many of you know, what, what, what you measure gets accomplished. Mm -hmm. So you know, for us, putting the stake in the ground said, we're moving towards something. It said that to our associates, to our clients, to our investors. Uh, but more importantly, I, I want to commend the mayor and Shannon and all at the Women's Commission because it allowed us to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, signing it meant we needed to do a lot more to get better. And they allowed us the opportunity to do that by sharing best practices with now 200 wonderful other companies. So when, when you're with a public company, we have almost 20,000 associates, 11th largest bank, 10 states. Uh, when you commit to something, you will accomplish it, but you often get the hammer when you don't. In this case, we are able to be a lot more vulnerable and we can learn from each other. And, and again, I commend the way that you allowed all of us to say, we have a lot more work to do. And you know, being able to sign means I personally here in Columbus can lead the charge for our organization. I take it very, very seriously. It's very personal to me. Sounds great. So I think what you heard from each of our panelists is that they understand the need and they understand their accountability to impact that. So we really thank you for your leadership here. What I'd like to do now is turn to Mike. And so I think most of you, if you've read the bios and any of you know anything about Cardinal, and certainly Mike Kaufman, you know that he has always been a champion for women. Uh, I tease him all the time, if I didn't have the best boss already, I would be trying to apply for a job over at Cardinal. <laughs> but you know, but I'm all good. So Mike, I'm gonna come over here. <laughs> I had to embarrass him a little bit. Uh, so I'm gonna come over here and talk a little bit about diversity and inclusion. And so we know that when we focus on diversity and inclusion, that addressing pay equity and creating general, uh, gender equity is just a byproduct of that work. So, and that work can't be done just by you or by the Women's Commission. So the question is, what should we each be doing to further these efforts here in Central Ohio? Well, I, um, I think first of all, everyone in this room can make a difference. And I think it's really, really important for organizations to make progress in gender equity or DNI in total. Um, you have to have commitment from the top. So, because if you don't have the CEO or the you know the top leader of a division or wherever you're at in charge of it, in, you know, committed to it, they won't allocate resources. People will know they're not really caring about it, so they won't allocate their personal time to it because they know it's not really important. So I think it really starts with that. But here's where everybody can make a difference. There's no way I can tell you that over the next couple months you won't be in a meeting where somewhere there won't be, you know, a woman won't sit off to the side in a chair. You have the opportunity to scoot your chair aside and ask her to join the table. 
you won't be sitting in some talent review discussion and someone's going to say, oh, I love this guy. He takes charge. He gets after it. He's on and on and on. And then a female comes up and they say, well, she's kind of bossy and annoying. And you're going to be the one that's going to stand up and say, can someone explain me the difference between Joe and Sally? Because we just described them very differently. But help me understand. And so there are so many instances where every one of us can do that. And I've had that opportunity to sit in meetings and watch tough assignments be given to a male because someone was going to give it to a female and said, well, she's got three kids, she's really busy, there's no way she's going to want to go to Europe for six weeks and do this tough assignment. So they give it to someone else thinking they're doing them a favor. And I've had the chance to call them out and say, but who's better qualified? And, and then they end up giving it to the female and she gets a chance to actually, you know, score some points and make a big deal in her career that can help elevator and I think there's all kinds of little things like that happen every single day and so that's where I think we make a difference is that we don't sit on the sidelines and no matter where you are you do those kind of things that you know in your heart are right to make a difference all right how many of you seen that in action in your workplaces so we know we can go back and make that change so what I'd like to do now is perhaps turn it over to mayor, the mayor and Denise on this question as CEOs and as mayor of our city what are some examples of things you have personally done to champion an overall culture of inclusion? Uh, and what do you think success looks like? So which one of you would like to start? Mm -hmm. We're going to start with you, Denise. You see how nice the mayor is, guys? Great job. <laughs> so I, I, first I would say is some of the things that we've done. It, um, Alvis has been around for 50 years. One of the things that I think is really important is that we get more nonprofits to sign on to the pledge. because. Um, mm -hmm. Although we're nonprofit, we have to make a profit. And um, mm -hmm. you know, it's really important when you look at organizations that are nonprofits. So, and Alvis is 50 years of, of service. If you walk into my boardroom at my uh, central offices, what you'll see is a wall of white men and me. <laughs> and that was our leadership for 50 years. There's, I'm the only woman and I'm the only um, African American that's in the, in the, on the wall. And it's telling because it's the first thing that you see if you walk into that room. Hmm. And so I kind of made it a personal thing for me is that um, I cannot let that just sit there. Um, actually, I had them put my picture in the middle of the... <laughs> <laughs> put a big gold frame around it. I love it. Put it in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> a little larger. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so, um, but I do think that it's really up to us to um, one of the things Mike said, and I, th I think I would challenge everyone in the audience too, if your company has not signed on, you should sign on um, immediately after this meeting. But the other things that I've done um, in our organization is to ensure that we are mentoring our women. Mm. Um, we really need to do mentoring with each other, with our staff. Um, we have a diversity committee um, in our organization. We do a lot of diversity and inclusion um, things. It's really difficult though, when you look at, again, I'm gonna say be repetitive, but when you look at my, not only my staff, but also the, the women, the female clients that we serve, um, you know, I'm in a unique position than most of everyone else up here is because I have to deal with our staff and our clients in this space. Um, but number two is that our clients um, you know, the gender-based programs that we provide to our clients are the same things we should be providing to our, to our staff. It's not, not any different. Um, I also think that education is one of the things that we have to do. We hired an outside consultant recently um, because we needed someone to come in from an outside look to look inside to, because we're looking at it all the time. And so I think it's really important to, to do those kinds of things. Also, you have to do a lot of measurements. I, I, I believe in data. I'm a data fanatic. Um, I just like seeing the numbers because the numbers mean something. Evidence also s says something. You do things that are based on the evidence. And so we, we study our EEO reports. We study our payroll records. We, we study all these things to ensure, ensure that we're doing the right thing. Sounds great. And Denise, we really thank you for the difference you're making in our communities. Yeah, it's pretty impactful. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know much about her work, get, just give her a round of applause for being amazing. All right, Mayor, let's hear from you. Tell us a little bit about, um, you know, what do, what do you think success looks like and what are some of the things you've personally done 
uh, in addition to the Women's Commission to champion uh, diversity and inclusion? Well, this is uh, definitely a place where I'm reminded of some great advice uh, I received early on. Uh, don't tell me what you believe, show me what you believe. And as mm -hmm. the leader um, of the city and CEOs of different organizations, uh, our employees, our partners, the community is looking at us. Right. Uh, it's one thing to say something, it's another thing to do something and to change uh, and commit to embracing the change that needs to take place. Uh, my vision is for the city to embed diversity and inclusion into our culture, to have it go from being a box that you check at the end of a process to a lens that you look through mm -hmm. in a, going after any of your challenges and, and opportunities in a strategic and thoughtful way. Uh, ultimately, I want that to be embedded into our culture mm -hmm. as a community, uh, the, you know, the diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. lens. So what that requires, first of all, is to make sure that you put together the most uh, diverse cabinet in the city's history. There are more women and directors of color in my administration, senior leadership in the mayor's office than ever before in the city's history. It's also critically important uh, that your positioning, uh, I think you know, Mike touched on it and Denise as well, uh, women within our organization for opportunities for growth and advancement, identifying them early on uh, and making sure they have mentors and connections, uh, uh, you know, to put them in positions to succeed in advance. Uh, and doing that five or ten years before, you know, people don't become directors overnight. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they, you've got to put them in positions to succeed in advance and put them in positions uh, in an external uh, facing way to lead different types of work in the community. Mm -hmm. So even though uh, you always hate to lose great people, when you're able to put people in positions uh, in, in the community where they can lead um, dramatic um, uh, and, 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 and change work, it gives them greater opportunities to serve the greater community. And I think it's also incumbent upon us, and one of the things that we've done uh, is started something called community benefit agreements on different uh, projects that we've been working on. Our first one was out on Fire Station 35 on uh, the Far East side. And we know women in particular, but also minorities, uh, have been far underrepresented in construction trades opportunities. And so in partnership with the Women's Commission and others here in the community really promoting these incredible opportunities for living wage careers in building construction trades and requiring on Station 35 that uh, you know at least 20% uh, of the folks working on that project that taxpayers are paying for, uh, that women and other minorities in Columbus and Franklin County residents are part of building the future of Columbus. If they're paying taxes here and making this community go, they ought to be part of building the future. We're loving it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can I drive that just one more yes. point home, uh, Gail? Because this is, again, we talk about how can we all make a, a real difference. And, you know, the mayor touched on it. Denise did. But, but let's, let's, let's wind this back a little bit and make sure that we all, I think, you know, women are doing their part here. I mean, we're, we're being, we're, we're preparing ourselves. We're putting ourselves in position. It's incumbent upon the companies to take it all the way down, if you look at entry-level management positions, there's still a discrepancy mm -hmm. from a gender perspective. More men are getting those jobs before women. So if you are in a position of leadership, if you are a hiring manager or you're at your company, you've got to take that down to that level and start looking at it there. If you look at mid-level managers, and it's, it's a slight discrepancy, but, but you can't catch up after it begins that way. Once you get to mid-level, then you get to kind of a 40-60. Then when you get to the C-suite, it goes 80-20. So I think a lot of the things that companies are doing very well intentioned are working on things that are kind of in the cauldron, that 2013, all that lean in. And you know, we, we took a lot of high-performing people and tried to make them better. But for us to drastically change the face of what we're, we are up against here, we have to really challenge ourselves at the base level of hiring to ensure that the right people are given those right opportunities and empowering those managers to be the best that they can possibly be. 
the last point that I want to make, and Gail's going to throw something at me because that wasn't the question. But I don't uh, throw. <laughs> <laughs> but we, actively, have the power to make a difference. And you know, the, the more that we prepare ourselves and the more you talk about putting people in the position, put yourself in a position to you know, there are a lot of people in the that are more than willing to help. Building relationships outside the walls of your organization uh, is not, it's good for the company, but it's empowering to you. Mm -hmm. You know, I was faced with an opportunity to um, either take or there could have been others that were chosen for the job. And I think what really helped me is the fact that I, I knew I had choices and I leaned in and said that I did. And that was an empowering thing for me, and I think it was eye-opening for those who are making those choices. But building and forming relationships takes a back seat to life sometimes because we, are, we just have so much that we're responsible for doing. But don't underestimate how important that might be within the company walls. Be intentional and be real about it. I think some very good insights. So what I'd like to do is transition a little bit and Mike and talk a little bit about the movements like the hashtag me too and the time's up and can you tell me a little bit about how those movements have changed the conversations between men and women in your organizations as it relates to gender equity and anyone else who wants to add to that so mike yeah this this is a really important one i'm really glad um, you brought this one up because um, i think if because i've done it before if i ask this audience who's either been sexually harassed or know someone that is, probably 75% of you would raise your hands if you're like any other audience that, uh, that I've been in. And so I think there's no doubt that it's great that we are talking about this and that people um, that deserve to be called out are being called out and being held accountable for this. So I completely <coughs> support it. But I can tell you the minute after this came out, I've been gravely concerned that the Me Too movement is setting back gender equity for decades. Um, and the reason is, is because that part's really important, but the part that's harder is people aren't willing to have conversations around their uncomfortableness. And so what happens is, I, I have been around multiple CEOs who have told me their new rule of thumb is, I will never go to lunch or dinner with a female. Many have told me that. I have had many females come to me and tell me stories of how some male colleague of theirs they used to go to dinner with or lunch with and spend social time with refuses to do it now because they're so worried that somebody's going to say something about that. Now personally, when I get asked about that, I think it's just a flat out cop out on the men. If you're not doing something stupid, then you shouldn't be worried about it. But, but the fact is, a lot of senior men have made this rule to themselves and no, one's, no one challenges them. And so when I hear someone say that, I look at them and go, really? And so is that the right way to handle that? I don't think it is. If you're uncomfortable with that, then find better ways to connect with women. Or if you're not going to do lunches and dinners with women, then you should not be allowed to have a lunch or dinner with a male. This, if we don't talk about these things, in my very first, I've been CEO a year and a half, my very first town hall, month after I got the job, I talked about diversity and inclusion, and I talked about this on the stage in front of all the employees and said to every male, if you're afraid to have a lunch or dinner with a female, then you can't have them with males. So you either got to figure it out, how to get it done, or you can't do it, because we're not going to be unfair about it. So. This is just a topic that you can tell me a little passion about because <laughs> I'm, I'm really worried that people aren't having the conversations. And we saw in the McKinsey data this year that the progress for women has stalled. Uh -huh. And I'm not sure how much this has to do with it, but I, I, I'm, I'm very concerned that this can have some long reaching impact. Well, yeah, go ahead, Denise. I just wanted to add because um, just the other day I happened to be home and I was watching. CBS this morning and um, Sheryl Sandberg was on and that was her conversation was that now in companies men are not promoting women because they won't have an individual meeting with them they won't go out to dinner with them and they certainly will not travel with them and so what, you, what Mike is saying is so true and and she had statistics that would blow your mind because well, she just she has, has experienced it in Facebook but also in other organizations you know I just so, want to go ahead Here's the issue. I mean, 
Um, there are people in, in your company, when, the, when these things came out, people knew in the organization what was going on. Mm -hmm. Why in the hell didn't the leaders know what, what was going on? So it's, it's also building the trust uh, and with the folks that you, everybody knows who's in the know in their own place. If I asked you, name one person who knows what the heck's going on, you all know who that is. <laughs> and I think it's important to, to A, make sure that they know it's okay to share, but you have to build that trust with them and have the right relationships. You do not want to be the last to know. But it's, it's easy to say, but hard to accomplish in reality. I get it, I get why, but we really have to get real and understand what's happening within our own organizations first and own up to those things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that starts at home. Thank you, thank you. I just got uh, a notice that we're getting close to our time, but I do want to ask, um, you know, I'm gonna ask each of you this question if you could. First of all, could you tell me a little bit about the fatigue that occurs with diversity and inclusion, even as we're talking about the Me Too and Time's Up and all of it? and just the work of it. How do you sustain yourself? How do you keep the momentum going? So just high level, each of you, if you would tell us what you're doing in that space. Who wants to start? I'm happy to start. I, I think that um, I saw this a couple years ago. I saw that we made a lot of progress and then it kind of got flat. And you could see our representation numbers, while they had gotten better, started to you know, level out. And you'll see this in the organizations. And I have found, and as I talk to people, if you don't stay on top of this topic, you actually begin to revert. Like, you can never give up on this topic. And so you periodically have to refresh. So that's what we did. We took all of our employee resource group leaders and the eight of them, we changed them all around and put new leaders in charge of them to bring new ideas and to train and get people immersed in it. We created a diversity and inclusion council of 15 individuals that also has been asked to engage in how we can get better. And so when you connect our head of DNI and our CHRO and our Diversity and Inclusion Council and our ERG members, it becomes a powerful force to keep pushing things ahead for us so we don't lose momentum. Sounds great. Denise, what's the... So because I have experienced the fatigue, um, I think that, um, like Mike is saying, what we've done in our organization is to regroup. We stopped and said, okay, nothing's happening in this space. Even the leaders of the diversity committee was not doing their work. And so what we did was we changed the people that were in charge, number one. But we also looked at ways of doing this in smaller groups, maybe larger groups, retreats, staff meetings, all those kinds of things, so that it's discussed in more than one, um, you know, one committee, that it's, it's discussed throughout the organization. So fatigue does happen. It happened to us for a year and a half until we had to regroup. Sounds great. Mayor? It's really about um, you know, making this a, a priority initiative and shifting it into the culture. So every year when directors come to me to present their budgets, they know what I'm expecting. You know, I want an update and, and a plan around workforce and supplier diversity. And I want to know what change, reform, and innovation uh, they're bringing me because otherwise I could care less what their budget and their priorities are because if they aren't focused on those things they know they're going to be evaluated based on those things they know I'm going to ask them about those things I'm going to harass them and 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 make sure that they are thinking about these things again through a lens as opposed to checking a box at the end of the process and I got to tell you it takes us setting bold ambitious goals my staff know when I say things like we're going to double the number of, of minority and female uh, police officers and firefighters in the next 10 mm -hmm. years, it scares the hell out of them. Mm -hmm. But you know what? They're focused on it every day. And every day that I meet with them, uh, they're figuring out new ways to help reach that goal. Because the last thing uh, we can afford to do uh, is to pat ourselves on the back, uh, celebrate yesterday's success, mm -hmm. and see a backslide. That is not... Uh, where America's opportunity city belongs uh, in the next generation. Yeah. Sounds great, Francie. And just sharing with, you know, sharing with others in the financial services industry, you know, we work with accountants, attorneys, uh, different law firms. So instead of just, again, staying within our four walls, I mean, we just keep talking to ourselves uh, and trying to get out 
and work with others who are experiencing the th same things that we're experiencing and learning from what they're accomplishing and getting our groups to mix a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that we're doing, it's, it's intentional, and I think it's helping us all get better. So one of the, the last question is when, we know that when women win, everyone wins. Our, and so my question for you, you all have shared a lot of great advice with us. So what would be the one last piece of advice that you would give uh, that would assist us in going back and creating cultures that win for all? And um, so Mike, I'm gonna pick on you once more and start with you. Gosh, it's hard to pick one, but I would probably, um say engage men since we haven't talked quite as much about that i don't want to miss that i think that if it weren't for the engagement i had uh, being running our gender equity initiative i wouldn't have learned what i did to have the passion and i see in a lot of companies and a lot of organizations that it's all women just in um, on their initiatives and if 95 percent of ceos are men and 83 percent of senior executives are men and you don't engage them, then they're gonna keep doing what they're doing. And so you've gotta find ways to get men truly, really involved in gender equity if you wanna make a difference. I would agree. Yes, Denise. Um, I, I think that we should always include it in our strategic plan for, for your organization. If you can c include the equity, uh, diversity and inclusion, um, I think that you always have those data points where you're always gonna be checking, you're always gonna be making sure that it's happening. So that's number one. But number two is there's also another piece that we have to deal with in my organization, is, and that's the transgender and the transsexual. Um, people seem, seem to forget that, but it needs to be included in the discussions. Mm -hmm. All right, Mayor. Well, um, to Mike's point, um, I know the last time we got together for this, uh, there were not many men in the room. And so we're making progress yeah, looking right. out this crowd as best as I can see you under the lights here. Uh, we're making progress. We're not there yet. Uh, but more men need to be part of this conversation, driving this conversation. And I think to a point that uh, Denise uh, and maybe Mike made earlier, particularly as uh, men leaders, don't assume. Ask the question and let the person answer for themselves. There are so many times on different leadership, who's going to take the lead, who's going to take this on, who's going to be our point person, and there are still so many assumptions I make as a male leader. That's right. I've got to ask the question and let the person answer for themselves. Sounds great. Francie? Not, not to pile on, but uh, just I, I think in this world that we're in today, we, there's just so much talking and telling. I don't know that we're really listening and learning. So I just ask when you're engaging with somebody, you know, how, how much are we listening and asking and how much are we telling? Mm. You know, Jim Thomas, a good friend of mine, is on the commission and we were chatting about he, when you learn about somebody who isn't like you, um, it does take a skill to stop this. It's hard for me, as you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> that. Uh, I think the other one would be that, you know, we have to, we have to practice what we preach. So you know, when I join a board, someone says, join the finance committee because you're a banker. Mm -hmm. I said, well, that's what I do every single day. Let me do something else so I can learn and grow. Mm -hmm. So I ask um, if you have resource groups at your organization, many of you might join the women's resource group, join a different one. <laughs> so you can in turn learn about somebody who may not be quite like you. So then you can use the richness of that to grow yourself and use those skill sets to make your company better. Join something different, do something outside your comfort zone. If we keep doing that as leaders, again, it makes us better, it makes our companies richer, and it really drives the point home. Wow, some great insights. So before we wrap up though, since we've been talking about men, and we do have quite a few <laughs> men, we're gonna embarrass you all, please stand. All of the men in the room, look at him, he moaning, groaning. <laughs> Give them a round of applause. Thank you all for coming out and supporting this work. Thank you. So we are at the end of our uh, session, and I think you would agree that these leaders are exceptional. I hope that uh, you have some insights that you'll be able to take back 
into your daily work lives and help us as we move the needle as it relates to women in the workplace and pay equity for all. If you would, please, let's give all of the panelists another big round of applause. Thank you so very much. Please welcome to the stage um, Chair of the Pay Equity Committee, Barb Smoot. Thank you, Sunditi. Wow, I love the chemistry of this panel and appreciate their leadership insights and their willingness to be vulnerable as we learn together. One thing that really resonated with me is the statement that the mayor made that this is not an initiative. It is at the heart and soul of the economic stability of our community. This group that was on stage today is fiercely committed to the work of the commission. They gave you numerous examples where they are personally involved in making pay equity a priority in their organizations. They're not simply just delegating it to the HR person to go do it or figure out how to do it. Each one of them are personally taking actions to address the issue. Would you please join me in giving them another round of applause? And I'm gonna do the same thing to Gail that she did to the First Lady. Where is Gail King? I know she hears me. I heard her laugh just now. Before we move any further in the program, I would like to offer special acknowledgement to Gail King for her leadership in the community and on this commission. Commissioners are able to serve two terms, and this is the final year of Gail's term. Gail, come on. And therefore, today's annual best practices session is her final session with us as a commissioner. Gail, we are grateful for your service. Thank you. My name is Barb Smoot, and I am the President and CEO of Women for Economic and Leadership Development, affectionately known as WELD. Our mission is to develop and advance women's leadership to strengthen the economic prosperity of the communities that we serve and equip women with the tools and leadership skills necessary to advance their careers and businesses. I serve as the Chair of the Pay Equity Committee of the Columbus Women's Commission, and it is an honor being able to serve our great city by being an ambassador of this work. Our work is focused on strengthening the economic security of our families to address gender and race-based disparity in our community. We are passionate about this work, and we collectively stand here today excited to announce that we have broken the 200 mark for the number of companies that have adopted the commitment. We, we have all of you in this room to thank for this major milestone, so please give yourselves a hand. While we are both excited and grateful for the success achieved today, to date, there is still much work to do. From what we have heard today, we know that there is still a pay gap nationally and locally. The pay ratio is 80 cents nationally and locally 78 sense for women on average. We use data-driven strategies to inform our work. You heard a, a series of stats from the First Lady earlier about the work done with the Women's Fund Wealth Gap Report. All journeys begin with a first step. Today our first step is to come together and to learn. As a community, there is nothing we can't accomplish if we all work constructively and productively with each other. The first tenet of the pledge we, we all signed was, continue to, was to continue to learn together. We are excited to have this opportunity today to learn from the experts, Lori Whisper and Marion Madden from Willis Towers Watson. Now their bios are in the program brochure, so I won't read them, but I will call out a couple of things in them. They will be sharing the state of pay equity. Lori, the Senior Director of Rewards at Willis Towers Watson, has over 30 years experience, both in consulting and corporate HR, primarily focused 
on global compensation and total reward strategy, program design, and process. Marion is rewards director with over 20 years experience as an advisor to external clients, organizational leaders, and internal practitioners on global total rewards and organizational matters. We are delighted to have them here today. Please join me in welcoming Lori and Marianne. Where are you? Hi, everyone. Thank you, Barb. First, um, I'd like to thank I'd like to thank the mayor and the first lady um, and the Women's Commission for inviting us here today. This is truly inspirational for Marianne and I. Why don't we shut this mic? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's it. I'm a numbers person, not a technology person. Can you shut it for me? Thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a truly inspirational event. We usually do get to speak on this topic, but it's more for boards of directors, senior executives, or groups of HR functions. And so it's really great to be here today to talk to you all about how this topic impacts a community. Um, and what, I, what we want to do is give some clarity and focus around the numbers because I think they do get a little mystifying, right? So part of our charge today is gonna be to inform you and educate a little bit about what the numbers mean. I think it was Francie that said numbers are important and that's very, very true. Um, but numbers are, don't tell the whole story. So that's the other objective that Marianne and I have today is to talk not only about what the numbers and the analyses that you can do mean, but what's really deeper. Like, why do we see these issues? Because if you take nothing else away from our talk today, what I'd want you to take is this. This is not a pay issue. I'm a, I'm a compensation consultant and a woman in the workplace for 30 years, but I would tell you this is not a pay issue. This is a representation issue, which is a much deeper and more difficult issue to resolve. It shows itself, the face of it is pay equity. So that's the number one message that I'm gonna kind of harp on today, but I'm gonna show you why. We'll talk about the legislation and what's going on in that space. Um, and also, all the, all the many, many messages coming out of social media and what's happening in the world at large from a cultural perspective. The panel talked a bit about that as well. And Marianne will go into that more and talk about what's going on in corporate America and really global um, business communities. Okay. Um, first, the numbers. <laughs> Uh, I heard 78 cents to the dollar here in Columbus. 79 cents is usually the number you hear nationally. What does that number really mean? And that is in reference to the gender pay gap. That comes from the National Partnership for Women and Families. It's an advocacy group out of Washington, D.C. And I wanted to share with you some numbers specific to that, because I think like when you talk about specific pay, it, it becomes real. So the gender pay gap, what you see here on your right, is just that. It's the median income for all full-time employees it, on an annual basis. So the median annual pay for a woman who holds a full-time job, full-time job, is a roughly $42,000. The median income for all men, full-time employees in a year, is $52,000. That's that 79 cents to a dollar. I, I kind of rounded it for you. But roughly $10,000 a year, all men, all women, no matter what jobs they're doing, 
no matter what their experience level is, no matter what their level in the organization is, no matter what their performance is. Anything that you might think, oh, but wait, what if they're doing X job? What if they've been with the company for 25 years? What if they're one of my best performers or, or a great performer? None of that is in that statistic, okay? And um, the 79 cents, or sometimes you hear 80 here in Columbus, 78, that's all women. When we actually break that down a little bit more, the gap becomes even wider. So for women of color, that's actually 61 cents. So depending on what statistics you look at, it can tell a pretty different story. And um, as I was doing a little bit of like refresh for today's session, uh, something popped up on my Google feed that said a recent Time Magazine Survey Monkey poll in April, because that was National Pay Day, it was like April 10th or something like that. Um, said that 46%, sorry for the males in the room, 46% of all men don't believe that, which I thought was really interesting. Nearly half of all men polled do not believe the gender pay gap means anything. And that's something we need to pay attention to because in some ways they're not wrong, right? This is a broad, broad brush but it's still indicative of what the, what the situation is in our country. This is different for other countries, by the way. Oh, so if you want to get better at figuring this out, right, if you want to go deeper than the gender pay gap, that specific term is specific to that set of calculations I just shared with you. If you want to say to whoever, the 46% of all men in this poll, that do, does not believe that means anything, what do you do? You do this. The term pay equity or equal pay is not the gender pay gap. Pay equity refers to a set of circumstances around jobs where we can definitively say, do we have an issue? There are many, many things that drive pay. Location is one, geographic location. Level is another. The job itself, we say, oh, we have to pay competitively within our organization. That's our pay philosophy. When you say that, you are meaning for specific jobs that kind of all things being equal, right? When, when organizations contact us and they say, help us figure out whether we're paying competitively, we look at specific jobs, right? We look at an entry level accountant. What is the going rate for that job? All of those things, and then we take the individual things, right? Like performance number years of experience or tenure, right? All of those things are what drive pay. When we do pay equity analysis, and I heard some of the panelists speak of this, we're holding all of those things constant because then we can apply gender or race or ethnicity or age or veteran status, anything you wanna look at, we can then apply to that predicted range of pay we come up with for a job where we can say, all things being equal, are men and women falling at different points within that predicted range? That's what this is. So when you hear that statistic of, oh, 46% of all men in the time survey poll didn't believe that, that's because there's a lot of noise in that. And we need to show them this. And this is hard to ref refute. Okay, let me move on. What's going on from a regulatory standpoint? I'm gonna focus a lot on the US for a minute, but I know many of you work for global companies, right? Um, this has been very interesting. So why now? Why pay equity now? 
We've heard about the gender pay gap for some time. And guess what? There have been legislation and regulation in the US since 1963. The Equal Pay Act was introduced in 1963, even before Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. That was 1964. Regulation's been around for a long time. The gender pay gap issue's been around for a long time, so why now? It's been like a perfect storm, that's why. There's been a lot of social media. The panel mentioned hashtag me too. There's been a lot going on from a global standpoint and we're kind of a, the world is flat, right? Kind of a business community now. Even if you don't work for global companies, many of the customers or, or channels that you serve may be global. You can't like put your head in the sand anymore, right? When these things are happening around the world. Let's just talk about a couple. If you work for a global company and you have 250 employees or more in the UK, you, were, you had a rude awakening in 2017 when the UK government said, you will report your gender pay gap, that median, and they also reported average there, by the way. In a government website, you can all go on and look. 9,000 companies in 2018, they had a report by, a, I believe it was April of 2018, their gender pay gap, if they had 250 employees or more. And here's the interesting thing. You could not spin this. You had to report it in the exact way that the UK government said. So you can look up any one of the 9,000 companies and you would see the same exact page, the same exact words, except for the statistics themselves. So the companies that we worked with in the UK said, what do we do now? This is showing something that's not so great. And why was it showing something that was not so great for most of those 9,000 companies? Because of what I said at the beginning. It's about representation. If you don't have enough women at the top, which most companies don't, right, you're going to show a big gap. And by the way, interestingly enough, the UK government website shows that. Not only did you have to report your gap, you had to report at, within levels that they defined. So it was like, I don't remember the exact label, senior management, management, professional support, those four. And there, it was two bar graphs, one going this way for men, one going that way for women. And what did it almost always show? The pattern was at the top, the men's bar chart, you know, graph was out here, and at the bottom, the women were out here. So you could see the representation issue very, very clearly. Why do I bring this up? Some people think that's coming here. I spoke with an attorney um, about a month ago, and she said something so interesting. She said, in the UK and other parts of Western Europe, they use the, we will shame you method. We will publicly shame you and here's the website to prove it. In the US, we just sue each other. <laughs> so that is sort of what the world is like right now, but it could come here. What we're seeing in the US are states. So the federal government has tons of regulations and legislation on this. They have, like I mentioned, the Equal Pay Act, Title VII, Lily Ledbetter, some other things, amendments to all of those acts that have tried to tighten up the language, along with the Department of Labor, depending on the administration that's in power, doing some things you know, on their own, right? Um, there was the uh, White House pledge, I think it was called, the Obama administration did. You, you may all be familiar with that. So the federal government actually has a lot it's just that you, in order to, like, sort of, you don't hear about it because, like my attorney friend said, it comes up when we sue each other. <laughs> so there are a lot of things going on on the state level, however. Um, let me show you that. 
If you operate in any of these states, in particular in California, no offense to anyone from California, but we call California the People's Republic of California for a reason, um, they are the most employee-centric state of all 50 states, and that applies to this type of legislation as well. Um, and there's lots of regulations going on in these states. Massachusetts, in 2017, it was, um, no, I take it back, it was 2018, I think it was effective this, year, this early fall, or early spring, sorry. Um, they passed the Massachusetts Equal Pay Act, or MEPA. So if you operate in Massachusetts, you may be very familiar with this. And again, this is, if you look at this holistically, right, you'd say, oh my gosh, this is a patchwork, how do I keep up? And that is the challenge in the US. So if you operate in multiple states, it probably behooves you to have something pretty sharp and crisp on this topic, right? So even though in Ohio you may not have these same types of legislation, maybe that's coming. If you operate in any of these states, you have to. So it's hard to like say, oh, we'll do this for one state and not the other, right? When you're when you're a big complex company, and even for smaller companies. Lori, I would just add that the state we don't have listed is Colorado, and it's because it literally happened last week as I was sending this file over to uh, the, the group here at the Women's Commission. But what the state general assembly uh, passed in Colorado was that companies are not allowed to ask for salaries which is now pretty popular. A lot of companies already do that, even if they don't specifically have operations in a specific state with legislation. But the other two things that were big, at least in my view, were that um, if you have an internal posting, you're required to post for it. You can't just tap someone on the shoulder and say, oh, I would like you to fill this new position. You actually have to post it externally. And then the third thing, that is big is that all the postings will also have salary ranges associated with them. So that means that if your company has operations in Colorado and you have employees who have similar positions as the ones you're posting, they can look in the Colorado postings to say, oh, look here, this position in Denver actually is paid X to Y, and I'm paid either above or below or maybe somewhere in the middle. So this comes a little bit around pay transparency and how that is something that many organizations are also grappling with and right. are starting to pay for. Yeah, we, we deal a lot with clients who ask us about paid transparency. How transparent do I have to be? It sometimes depends what state you operate in because you may be forced to being more transparent than you want to be. But even from a non-regulatory standpoint, there's so much out there on the internet, right, that employees can just go look at. It's kind of hard to to figure that out, <coughs> excuse me. And one more thing about California that happened late last year, they also um, passed a law, a, a state law around the number of women you have to have on your board, uh, your board of directors if you're a publicly traded company. And it was, the thing that struck me was how specific it was. It was kind of a ratio, so it said if you have five board directors, you have to have two that are women. If you have seven, you have to have three, and it just went on and on, and I'm like, wow, they are not messing around, right? They are really like focusing on, on this. Um, so these are some of the um, things that the EEOC looks at, and they, they're going to start, I don't know if all of you have heard this, so we already have to do a lot of EEOC reporting, right? They're going to now, it's actually, I believe, in public debate, so if you want to comment on this coming legislation, you can, still, I believe. This is something new that the EEOC is considering, which I personally found shocking. I, this is something I would have expected more under the Obama administration, but even the Trump administration is embracing um, some of this. So this is way more reporting on pay than I think we've ever had to do to comply with EEOC. So that's an interesting coming 
um, event for us to consider. Okay, um, this is my last slide, and then I'm going to turn it over to, um, to Marianne. This is, so regula regulation, we can't like get around that, right? Compliance is key, and definitely happening here in the US, very much happening in other countries, especially in Western Europe. But there's also a whole cultural shift. So when I said, why now? This is a lot of the why now. And I just want to point out a couple. Um, Mary Ann's actually going to talk. Here we have you. This is amazing, right? But Mary Ann's going to talk about what's going on at the board, board of directors level as well. I do want to tell one quick story. Have you seen the CEO interview on 60 Minutes, show of hands? OK, many of you have. For those of you that haven't, I highly, highly recommend that you Google it. Um, Mark Benio, I think is how you pronounce his name, is the CEO of Salesforce.com. Leslie Stahl interviewed him because four years ago, his CHRO came to him. And by the way, um, Salesforce.com has been number one on the best places for women to work, I don't know how many years. And um, his CHRO came to him and said, gosh, Mark, I think we have a pay equity problem with women, gender, gender pay equity. And he said, that's impossible. I do everything for women. He said that on the, on the interview. I'm like, wow, OK. Um, and you know, he, he was just aghast that she would even suggest it. And he said, to prove, her name's Cindy. Cindy, to prove you wrong, I'm gonna, we're going to go ahead and do it. This was four years ago. And what did they find? Of course, they found they did have an issue to the tune of over $3 million. He spent $3 million in, I think it was 2015, to fix his gender pay equity issues. And at, he was so amazed at what it showed. And he sort of became like a convert. He said, I want to do this again next year. And she said, why? We don't need to. We fixed it. Check the box, move on, right? And he said, nope, I just want to prove to myself that we did fix it. And so in 2016, they did it again. And what did they find? Almost the same exact issue to the tune of about 2.6 million. He spent 3.2 or 3.4 million, something like that. 2.6 million the following year. Why? Because Salesforce.com is one of those companies that does a lot of acquisition. They're very acquisitive every year. They bought 22 other companies, and they bought their gender pay equity issues when they bought them. Um, but even if they didn't, they hire a ton of new people every year, lots of turnover and just growth, right? And they saw, they saw it in that as well. And um, she has a blog, the, the CHRO, I forget her last name, I'll tell you in a second. And she, she wrote about this. So um, Mark Benio on 60 Minutes said, I am now convinced I need to do this every year. And um, the CHRO wrote on her blog, they're in their fourth year, this last year, of doing the gender pay equity analysis, and they've spent $10.3 million, which is not small, I'll give you one other comparison. Google came out about two years ago and said, oh, we did the analysis and we have a 97, a 3% gap, 97 cents to the dollar, and we spent $327,000 and it's fixed. Gone, we don't have to worry about this anymore. Salesforce.com, I'm telling you this story because it's what I said at the beginning. What they have figured out is that it's not about pay. This comes up every year. I have clients that say to me, Lori, we spent all this money last year, and here I am again. It's so frustrating. These are compensation professionals, right, that sit in HR. They're all about the numbers. And I say to them, have you worked with your HR colleagues or with executive leadership on this issue? Like, what do you mean? Yeah, I went and got money. It's not just about paying the money, right? If you continue to hire 
at different rates for men and women, if you continue to promote differently, if you continue to assess performance differently, if you continue to learn and develop folk, you know, have leadership programs differently. That is what causes the representation issue, which cause the pay equity issues. This is a broad business problem and challenge that's gonna take more than just doing the analysis, is my message back to you. And that is what the CHRO of Salesforce.com said. She said, we're on this journey, we're doing this every year, and our goal is that it gets smaller and smaller and smaller every year. Because they're also putting lots of other stuff in place. So I'm gonna turn it over to Marianne. Oh, I took eight. So shareholders are asking a lot of questions, and the shareholders vary. Um, some are large pensions, such as the New York City pensions. Um, the comptroller from that city actually sent letters to investor or companies that they invest in within healthcare and insurance, um, asking them to report on their gender pay gap. And you can Google these letters, you can find um, the, the responses as well. Uh, you also have um, ESG shareholders. So those are environmental, social, and governance focused shareholders. And their focus really in this space is around the pay gap. Arjuna Capital is one of the most well known, probably because they get a lot of media and partially because they're also targeting very large global tech and financial services companies. And they've been doing this over several years. Google was one of the companies that they sent shareholder proposals to. Google ignored them. Google finally, as Lori mentioned, um, released their pay gap <coughs> statistics last year. Um, but this year, what they did, and they announced this back in February, they have a big press release and they go through and list the 12 companies that they're targeting. This year they had similar companies on their list than they had previous years. So they, they looked at um, Intel, they were looking at Google, Facebook, Amazon, Adobe, as well as financial services companies such as um, MasterCard, Amex, uh, Bank of America, Bank of New York, as well as Citigroup. And what was different this year was that this year they were asking for the median pay gap. In the past, they had just been really asking for the pay gap itself, but the other things that they asked for were different in terms of the components of compensation. It was base pay, incentive compensation, and equity compensation. And so why they were throwing in the, the incentive compensation is, again, it comes to representation, as Lori's been mentioning. You have a lot of executives that are male, all receiving equity compensation. As you go down levels in the organization, those, the equity compensation is not eligible at those lower levels. So even if you have a really large population of women at the lower level or the mid-level, they're likely not receiving equity compensation. So if you look at the gender pay gap for base pay, your organization might look okay. But as you start to add in bonus, as well as equity compensation, that gap is gonna get larger. And in terms of the reasoning why Arjuna Capital is targeting these companies as well as asking for these statistics, again, they're coming back to women in leadership and why there's a lack of representation. And it's not the I got you effect, at least from their perspective. They want to understand the story, the journey that the company is going on from today into next year and why their numbers changing or why they're not changing. Board diversity, as Lori mentioned, is also a focus. And this is a focus from institutional investors, and there's trillions of dollars at stake here. And so when these institutional investors with tons of money start saying, if you don't do what I ask you to, you're not gonna get my money, companies actually pay attention. And so that's what State, State, State Street Global Investors, as well as BlackRock, um, had announced with their policies, Glass Lewis and Institutional Shareholder Services, ISS. They also have similar policies, again, about voting. And this has to do with board diversity. So if they find a slate that is up for um, vote and it doesn't include any diverse board members, including from a gender perspective, they're gonna vote no. 
And as a result of the state street uh, policy, which you may be a little bit more familiar with because they are the organization that put the fearless girl down in the financial district uh, within New York that's City. That picture, yeah. have y'all so seen the fearless girl? I guess now she's in London. She's doing a little bit of a tour around the world. <laughs> um, but they did that back in 2017. It was a bit publicity stunt. You know, I saw it was across the news. People were going downtown New York City to get their picture taken with the fearless girl. The artist who uh, created the bull, he was upset about the whole situation. <laughs> so <laughs> there was a lot of drama going around. But in reality, it caused a, a lot of attention to it. And as a result of uh, the State Street um, policy, over 420 companies now have women on their boards, whereas previously they were a male gender board only. So one comment, I mean, why would boards of directors care about this, right? We all know it's the right thing to do from a social standpoint, but here's the reality. It's really good for business. Um, McKinsey's done a study that has shown that if you have more diverse workforce, and especially at the top, it's actually good for business and you, you, make, you grow profit. So boards, and in particular Larry Fink, who is the CEO and chairman of BlackRock that has basically come out and said this, say you know, profit and purpose go hand in hand, and purpose includes this topic. In the, in the ESG, it's part of the social, the S of the ESG. And so it's not only the right thing to do, it's good for our businesses, right? And most, the, the great thing, being someone that's been in the workforce for a long time, the great thing about that is we actually don't have to convince people of that anymore. They, most of the time, they get it, right? But now you have institutional shareholders and board, uh, you know, and these big, private equity firms that own lots of companies saying, guys, you got to do this. And most of the time it is guys, but um, sorry, go ahead, no, Marianne. Yeah. Um, I know Lori mentioned the California law. The one thing she didn't mention is that there is a fine associated with it. And she talked about you know, what's happening across the globe. And often what we find is if there's some sort of reporting or fines that companies have to pay if they're not in compliance, that the law actually sticks or the change actually happens. And so with California, if you're not complying the first time, offense is $100,000, and thereafter it's $300,000. So, um, and the other thing to note is that it doesn't mean that you're incorporated in California, it means that you have headquarters there. So there's a lot of companies that are incorporated in Delaware, there's been a lot of fighting about this, but clearly is this good for business if you're one of those companies that is, is fighting the law that has been instituted. So what we're finding is that there is a new lens on what is fair. It used to be just looking at market-based compensation, the external aspects, looking at your internal equity, kind of wiping your hands and saying that you're good and done. Now there are other aspects such as the social. Are you providing a living wage for your employees? It's looking at your demographics and what pay transparency and what pay fairness means across gender, ethnicity, ages. It's looking at what is fair from an executive to an employee rate pay ratio, but then also looking at it from where your employees sit across the globe and what those cultural norms are and what those markets mean. Because there's a lot more things, I would say, out in Western Europe that companies and employees are used to in terms of openness around fairness than you find here in the US. You still find that even though it's not illegal to ask what someone else is making and talk about your pay, that generally most employees aren't necessarily you know, holding up a sign with their salary on their, you know, in, at their desk. So as Lori mentioned, um, ethnically and genderly diverse companies outperform uh, their peers. So it's great that we now have some statistics that show that this is good for business. It's also good in terms of attraction and retention. It's great for uh, your branding of your organization. And <coughs> most importantly, it can help mitigate risk. So if anything, there's the, oh, this is good for business, but I know a lot of things that um, when you, I talk to companies, 
They're just trying to make sure that they stay out of the media for getting some sort of a litigation or some sort of audit. Um, many of them are often just trying to figure out where they're at and then where they're going to go from there. So in terms of what organizations need to do or what they're trying to do, it's, it's the what do we have to do? And then from there, the question becomes, well, what do we actually want to do? So first, it is usually about compliance, and we don't want to minimize that. Compliance is super important wherever you're sitting in what state or country. But if that's all it's about, it, then it's always going to be a compliance exercise. And it doesn't serve you well as an organization to have it just be that sort of check the box. That's been the learning for me. Yes, I would say that the vast majority of companies that are reaching out, while they might have compliance matters that they're having to deal with, they're more so just trying to understand the lay of the land, what this means from a US perspective. Sometimes it is a global perspective. Um, but those that are um, really integrating this as part of their organization and their compensation programs, they're integrating it within their strategies, their processes their transparency and what transparency exactly means, which I know can be very different depending on who you talk to, as well as governance. So we would say the governance is key here. If you don't have a lot, that's where you're likely going to find issues. In terms of you know, having a lot of flexibility, being very be de decentralized, those are the types of organizations that we find actually have larger pay gaps because there isn't a consistency, there's not guardrails, there's not guidelines in place to help make sure that as managers are making pay decisions, so it's managers are often doing this unconsciously, trying not to be biased, but they're doing it in a way that is actually causing the issue to occur rather than allevi alleviating it. And then those companies that we're finding that are owning this, they're actually tying this in the, to their talent programs, their IND, inclusion and diversity programs, their culture, it's part of their talent acquisition. So they understand that this can start from day one when you recruit your employees into your organization, what the starting pay is, what is the process to find talent, are you somehow opting out candidates and you don't realize that you're opting out it from a gender or an ethnicity perspective? Is it happening from a, a broader sense in your organization? And so this is where we say it's embedded as part of your entire employee life cycle. As I mentioned, you know, starting pay is something that we will often look at. Is, that, is there a gap within your starting pay rates? Is it something that's occurring in terms of performance management, in terms of how employees are rated, how employees are promoted. We look at the time and position to see how quickly men versus women and ethnicities are being promoted. Is there a gap happening there? It's also looking at are um, you providing the same opportunities in terms of development to both men and women as well as ethnicities, as well as, you know, Compensation it seems to be the easy one. Well, let's look and, and we'll look at the rating, we'll look at their performance, we'll look at the market data, this is what they should be receiving. But are we looking at this holistically to make sure that um, somehow the performance rating, there are things that aren't causing this to happen and that we don't need to adjust someone to even get to where they should be. And, and when we look at bonuses and equity compensation, uh, the one thing that I've heard from some clients is, well, well, especially if it's a CEO in a private company, that they're like, we like the flexibility and not having structure around how we make awards. Well, that's how you start to run into issues because no one's necessarily looking across the board at the consistency. Does everyone have the same target opportunity by job level within their job? Is it something that you can um, easily point to your guidance and your governance, or is it something that more so is so flexible that you're having to go back to notes and say, well, this is the reason why this person's uh, award is different than the other? I did, Marianne and I attended a pay equity conference in San Francisco in March, and one of the speakers um, actually said, we should just do away with all manager discretion in making pay decisions. 
And I sort of said to myself, how would you ever do that? Because even, you know, you'd have to have maybe even the most formulaic approach. But I don't think going to that extreme is necessary, right? Because you solve one problem, but you probably cause 10 others. Um, but there does need to be kind of a system, right? An infrastructure of how you want managers to make decisions. And I kind of call it guided discretion, right? We're not going to just let you make whatever decision you want, we're going to guide you. Yeah, and we would say that um, your analysis is only as good as your data. So if you have a mess of your job data, of your comp structures, it's only going to exasperate the data that you get back. And you're not going to be able to make sense of it. I have one client where they literally have a different pay structure for every single, and job level structure for every single department. So when we looked at their pay equity, it was really difficult to say holistically across the organization, oh, within this job level, you know, we see an issue. It, it, it was one of those things that were like, you know, it's great that you guys have the structure in place, but it was almost to the, the far right that we wouldn't have expect versus others that don't have any type of structure. And then we're trying to figure out, well, how can we ensure that we're providing information to you, the client, in terms of how the data is reported back, that it makes sense to you, and you're able to go back to your own organization and then explain what's happening, and potentially then also do more investigation in terms of trying to understand why those gaps are occurring. And um, just to say, I mentioned earlier the Massachusetts Equal Pay Act. In the act itself, if you read it, it's a, the number one, they have a whole bunch of, they list a whole bunch of things that they consider um, defensible, right? These are defensible actions if you are slapped with, um, you know, a, a penalty or a suit. The first one is a, what they refer to as a job evaluation system. If you have, meaning, if you have a good system in place that defines jobs, that's actually a defense against an action, which I found logical being in the profession that I am, but it backs up what Marianne is saying. And the key to these analyses is to, just as she said, to be able to explain. It's not to say that you won't have differences. You will. But are they differences you can explain and justify? If the differences are based on performance and you feel really good about how those ratings work, that's a defense that I think you know, any government or a judicial body would take into account, right? And so that's the nature of the analysis is, can we come up with a predicted range of pay? And when there are differences, are they explainable outside of any protected class? So the difference can't, the, ex, the explanation cannot be, oh, men negotiate better than women, for example, on the way in. They, they just negotiate better, which is true. Um, that can't be, a, that's not a good defense. The other one that it can't be is, oh, this man made more money at his last job than this woman. So I just have to meet that, even though you can't ask that anymore. Um, so that's not a good defense either. Like anything related to a protected class specifically is not a good way to explain the differences in pay. And we'll talk more about this at our breakout session, I believe. Yeah. But we, yeah. we're getting kind of the hook, well, so we have yeah. to. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Yes, that was actually our last, that, okay. our last slide. And I know that, I think Shelley. I think we had a couple questions you want us, wanted us to answer, right? Um, Oh, she's behind Our, us. Shelly, <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank you, Lori and Marianne. Oh, for, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and two more questions I have that would value your insight on oh, your I think we have to turn this back on. It's just muted. We oh, turned it off because it was echoing. Here. <laughs> oh, you sure? Yes. Um, 
So two questions I would have about your insight on while you're still with us. Um, what is the biggest aha moment that you've had in this work around pay equity, inclusion, and gender equity in the workplace? And what advice would you have for us here in Columbus, Ohio, as we are on this journey? Um, so in terms of the aha moment, I think I've had a couple, but uh, I think the biggest was when um, I attended the World at Work Pay Equity Symposium. It was filled with companies, um, global organizations, lots of compensation professionals, all talking about how they do their own analysis, um, trying to make sense of everything. And it was interesting because some of the companies that were in the room who've been doing this type of analysis for several years, their goal was to try to get to one. So meaning no gap, which is great. I mean, that would be ideal. But the way they were looking to alleviate that gap was to do what I would say would be the wrong things. So rather than adjust male and female or white and non-white pay, they were going to choose the gender, such as women, to only adjust. So our perspective is do the right thing. If you find males that are underpaid, that you would need to adjust those. That might mean that your pay gap doesn't really move that much, but your story is we found both men and women who are underpaid and we adjusted them. So that would, I think that that is, it's almost like a philosophical question that within your own organization, and when we talk with clients, okay, how are you going to remediate this? Obviously, the, 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 those that are underpaid significantly, you need to figure out what your plan is, but is it going to be that you're only going to change one gender, or are you going to potentially do and to both change gender, ethnicity, and make sure that everyone is being paid fairly rather than just looking at one side of this story? Yeah, and just um, I'll tell you my quick aha moment. I, I was all, always under, I guess I should call it an urban myth, that men and women came in pretty much at the same level as a starting point. They, men and women um, graduate college at the same rates. In fact, I think women have overtaken men in that in just a little bit. And I thought, oh, we all kind of start at the same point, and then um, you know, the gap kind of widens as, as careers progress. And McKinsey did a recent study with the Lean In Foundation. Have any of you seen it? It's called um, Women in the Workplace, I believe. They did it in 2017 and again in 2018, and it actually showed no. I, I was proven wrong. So this was, I was very surprised. Men and women do come in at different rates, and that just gets exasperated over time. And they show the exact statistics. This is a very like broad study. Get your hands on it if, if you want to. It's really good, good reading. Um, my advice for Columbus. This is a interesting time right for all of us. Like I said, I've been in the workforce over 30 years, and I actually do remember a time I tell my younger colleagues, I remember sitting in a room when somebody said, oh, let's give Susie, you know, we could give her less money because she's not the primary breadwinner, right? Um, and, you know, when I tell them other stories, they go, you lived in like Mad Men times. And I'm like, not quite. Um, so, you know, we have progressed quite a bit, but we're definitely not there yet. And one of the things that I find um, really inspirational is all the stuff that's going on with young women in our education system these days. But that's where we have to start. Like you're all employers doing the right thing and kudos to you for doing it. But as a community, what are we doing to get girls more into professions that just pay more? I mean. We are a market-based economy, right? We're never gonna be a socialist economy, I don't think, that says, oh, everyone's just gonna make the same amount of money no matter what they do. And so what are we doing from an education perspective and a mentoring perspective? We have STEM programs for girls. Maybe there needs to be more of that, right? So this, I think, as a community, you guys are so cool that you do even this. I could just see you, you know, taking this even deeper beyond the employment stage to go, okay, if we need more female engineers, how do we do that, right? Everybody's, if, if there's 20% graduating female engineers 
and we're all going for them, that's probably not going to work, right? How do we get more? Well, you got to get more girls interested in engineering. So that would be my advice to you is start at the, look at the grassroots too, right? You're, you're looking at the top, which is great, the employment picture, I mean. But how does, where does it actually start in getting girls into professions that actually just pay more? So good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> both for being with us today and sharing with us. Thank you. Um, I'm Shelley Biting, uh, the Executive Director of the Columbus Women's Commission in Mayor Ginther's office. And I also want to say thank you for being with us today. As it's been shared this morning, this is a journey uh, for all of us to be on, to look at innovative ways that we can truly impact our community, but also to celebrate here together. So thank you. Um, since last fall, the Women's Commission has held various touch points, so opportunities to come together as adopters of the Columbus Commitment to learn had four lunch and learns over the past several months. Both, all of those have been at capacity. And we've learned that we truly need to be in conversation with, with one another to learn from each other. And you can continue to be engaged with us this fall as we continue to host opportunities for learning. Thank you again to our presenters, to our panelists, to First Lady Shannon Ginther and the mayor for your leadership and your vision for our community. Um, thank you to the appointed commissioners, and I'd like for them to stand, for those that are here, um, the ambassadors of this work here in our community. Thank you for your service. <laughs> and thank you to Ohio State University and the Athletic Department for hosting us today. Um, also, a quick thank you to all of our sponsors to truly make today possible um, to have an event to learn together that is free for us as employers. Um, so AEP, Baker Hostetler, Cardinal Health, the Columbus Partnership, emh and Fifth Third Bank, Huntington, L Brands, Nationwide, Ohio Health, Ohio State Ath University Athletics, and Columbus Women's Commissioner Jeff Little. Thank you again. So just a few housekeeping notes to move us into um, the rest of our morning. We have two breakout session options. The first one, investigating whether you have a problem. So the pay equity and analysis conversation. So Lori and Marianne will continue to be with us for that conversation and that will be in the Clinton room. And then building a workplace where everyone thrives. That will be in the ballroom. So we have five local leaders sharing about their company's journey, their strategies, and lessons learned along the way. We recognize this morning has been a lot of presenting to you all, so in each of our breakouts, we do have opportunity to learn from those around us. We'll have about a 15-minute break, um, so we ask you to be in the breakout sessions by 10.15 to get that session started. They will conclude by 11.30, and most importantly, there are mid-morning snacks and beverages and coffee located in your breakout rooms. So thank you again for your commitment to this work, and have a wonderful rest of your day.